Yes, I remember that the Mako has a cannon this time. Hey, everyone. Hey. It's time for a little bit of an impressions video. It's a bit long because there's three games in one this time. Free review copy. We. Oui. Thanks, EA. Mass Effect Legendary Edition. I think it comes out tomorrow. Lots of videos already popping up about it, though. Um, well, tomorrow at the time of this recording. Yes. Well, uh, I'm, I'm planning to get this up this evening, so it'll still be tomorrow <laughs> by the time this goes up. Mass Effect Legendary Edition is the remastered trilogy of the Mass Effect series. In this case, though, uh, I would say it's a much more needed remaster than a lot of the usual remastered collections and also actually a technical upgrade for a freaking change um <laughs> uh, uh i'm looking at you jack and daxter so what exactly do you mean lewis so wise one who has played all the games before well the star of the show in this case is actually mass effect one and if you want a comparison to the console version we've actually well, done a playthrough of the xbox 360 That's version on this channel i'll link it in a recommendation or something at the end of this but like basically mass effect one out of all three mass effect games was uh, uh, how do i put this politely it was a bit of a hot mess <laughs> um especially on it was, very, it was very clearly the bridge between nice ideal republic and what mass effect 2 and 3 was going to be yes yes it, that 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 as well but especially on consoles it just wasn't very well optimized and even if you're going to play it on pc it has issues which i'll get into a bit later one of the first additions they made to uh, the entire trilogy though was to transplant the default female shepherd face from Mass Effect 3 into Mass Effect 1 and 2, which is nice. We can be consistent now. Another thing that lets us be consistent is that they've transplanted basically all of the additional um, face creation components, colors, um, shapes, that kind of thing, hairstyles onto Mass Effect 1 and 2. So, um, and uh, another cool thing is that Mass Effect 2 and 3 had this sort of code sharing thing that you could um, share your codes with people um, or keep your codes in a text file somewhere for later use and then just sort of paste them in. And like magic, you would have uh, the face already set up. It's not like completely uniform ac across all three games. Mass Effect 1 is still largely using just a spruced up version of Mass Effect 1's graphics engine. So, and so is two, so are two and three, they're using their original graphics engines, just shinier. So there is still some graphical difference between how the three games handle their faces. And Mass Effect 1 is still the only game with that scar option. Oh, this is, this is an interesting thing they added to Mass Effect 1. Um, if, perhaps, you thought Mass Effect 1 leveled you up a little too frequently across the game and thought it was tedious to go into the level up menu quite as often as that game sends you there, um, you can switch over to what's called Legendary Mode in the level scaling option there. And instead of leveling up to 60, you'll level up to 30 and you'll just level up half as often and get twice as many points every time you level up so um that's an option there if you want it i'm so used to playing mass effect one then i just stick stick to the um classic mode as far as level ups are concerned but oh boy there's so much to talk about in the mass effect one remaster i'm i i, I keep losing my thread why don't you get started as new stuff pops up um obviously it looks better like, it looks a lot better. It's, in fact, I would say it's it's the only remaster in this trilogy that substantially looks like it's been upgraded. Mass Effects 2 and 3 have had changes made, but it's mostly the kind of under the hood stuff or less apparent stuff that you would need to actually play through the game in its entirety to really appreciate. So for the most part, 2 and 3 are just straight enhanced ports, which by itself is kind of worth it for other reasons, but Mass Effect 1 has not so much been overhauled, but it's had a lot of its rough edges sanded out. And I don't just mean the part where the console version would stutter and have texture pop in all over the place. That's all gone, obviously, but like 
just a lot of gameplay elements have been upgraded so that they aren't quite as constantly annoying. Everything from how the way guns work to the way the inventory menu works to um, the way the vehicle works. It's all just... The game feels can... good to play. <laughs> how about that? I heard there is an option to make the move buggy just as bouncy as it was before, though, if you really wanted to. I don't think so. The, the, the moon buggy is oh, it is still bouncy. It's just not bouncy to the point where it interferes with your ability to get things done is, yeah, is the yeah. thing. I'll be showing some of that off in a bit. There is an option related to the moon buggy, but I'll, I'll get to that when uh, we're actually seeing it in action. Man, Joker, you went from stealing hearts to just being part of a crew. <laughs> uh, brittle bone disease will do that to you. But yeah, all the voice acting is intact. Every I don't I haven't run into anyone who's had their voices replaced. Thank God. It seems no, it's like probably be more expensive than it's worth, considering how much dialogue it's in this, these three games. Yeah, yeah, it would. But sometimes when games get re-released, voice actors get replaced for one reason or another. So I figured I'd mention it. Cartho Nassi is still here playing the part of Kaiden Alenko. <laughs> um, if you're wondering why Commander Shepard is like edgy goth chick in this video, it's because I wanted to show off some of the character creation options that aren't available in the original game. Some of the stuff they added in Mass Effect 3 that didn't appear in the previous two games. So, yeah, we get like, uh, I don't know. Uh, Mass Effect starring Pushing Up Roses or something. <laughs> um, Mass Effect starring all the emo kids from your local high school. Um, but yeah, everyone's nice and texture, texture enhanced. And you could get this kind of visual effect from Mass Effect 1 on PC if you didn't mind dipping into texture mods and stuff. But... It's it's uh, it's so nice it's to be in like this. Yeah, I was gonna say it's just probably just more convenient just to have a better version of it. Yeah, it is. Um, a lot of the time, the texture mods that I have experience with use a lot of like completely uncompressed 4K textures for everything, and that oh boy, eating up your hard drive. Yeah, it eats up a lot of hard drive space, and the load times can be something special as well. Um, but like. I've been I, I've been playing. This is the PC version of the game, uh, to be specific. Uh, my press copy is the Origin copy, and that's good because I learned several things about the PC version that I didn't that I wouldn't have known if I had just played the console version that I pre-ordered. One of the things I'm sure the, I'm sure the console version is more or less just as good at this point, considering they're ten plus year old games. Oh yeah. But one of the things is that I was able to record this using my Elgato, um, writing all the video files on the same drive I was playing the car, uh, the game off of, which is the regular hard drive, not the not the um, solid state drive, and the load times were excellent, so the game runs well. There was a bit of um, frame rate slowdown during the moon buggy section, but that probably was it's just because I was using the drive to record the footage. Um, if you were playing it on a solid state drive, I imagine it would play smooth as butter. The other thing that I, that I learned while playing the PC version specifically is that it supports PC controls and gamepad controls, and you don't need to set it in the options menu which one you're using. It'll just transition smoothly between both control modes as you're playing the game if you, like, move the mouse over the screen or something. So, yeah, it's um, it's good in that re respect. Maybe you like exploring the towns with a gamepad, but want to go to go to mouse and keyboard when the chips are down, or you're using the game the gamepad for most of it, but would rather aim your gun with the goddamn mouse. Well, you can do whatever you want. Go ahead, go wild. Also, Captain Anderson, he's rocking his like Mass Effect three face textures here. He looks good. <laughs> I like it. <laughs> Do you like a shepherd? I went to the I went to the beauty parlor before I gave you. <laughs> um, Mass Effect One and Two had a particular uh, Captain Anderson face, but Mass Effect Three um, gave him like a much better face texture. 
and they seem to have decided that Captain Anderson is important enough that his face needs to be semi-consistent across all three games. So while he's still, I'm pretty sure, still using his Mass Effect 1 model here, maybe with some tweaks, um, his face texture has been upgraded substantially to match the way he looks in Mass Effect 3. And What's right with your face? This mission just got a lot more complicated. A small Ah, Nihilus. Your life was too short. It's our best chance to secure the uh, green biker dude. <laughs> Grab your gear and meet us in the cargo hold. I mean, he's got a pretty detailed model for being a green biker dude, Never but essentially. You're going in. So I imagine then there needs to be a mod at some point where you did, where there's a, it just changes his armor to be super green. <laughs> so he can't be green biker dude. <laughs> Ah, uh, Eden Prime looks so goddamn pretty. Yeah, this looks less like a 360 game and more like a very early PS4 X-Bone game. Yeah, it's it's interesting because, like, Mass Effect 1 was the game that had aged the worst graphically, but now... Which is to be expected considering everything, so... Yeah, but now, going by this remaster, I'd say Mass Effect 2 is the one that looks the, uh, the weakest... Because 2 and 3 essentially look identical to their PC versions running at max specs, maybe with some added texture work, maybe some some spruced up lighting. Uh, I haven't run side-by-side -side comparisons, so I can't really tell you. The result, though, is that Mass Effect 2's graphical blandness kind of shines through a bit. Um, Mass Effect 2 was the one that, well, was made right after EA acquired Bioware, and... It, it, it was pretty obvious that um, the game's quality was largely contingent upon the team just having really good management to get through that era of less time, less money. Um, and the, as a result of that, some of the areas look a bit sterile. There's quite a bit of resource copy-pasting throughout. And as a result, uh, most of the visually striking stuff going on in Mass Effect 2 actually happens, like, when the elusive man is on screen or when you're doing a DLC mission. <laughs> and um, I wasn't able to get to any of that, so we're gonna, not going to be seeing very much Mass Effect 2 footage in this video. Um, but Mass Effect 1 has... Oh, that's another thing they added to the remaster. There's a sprint button now that you can just use outside of battle. Huzzah. Like, all three, all, all, both of the both of the sequels had a, a sprint button that you could use whenever you wanted to just speed up travel from one area to another. But Mass Effect One only allowed you to sprint in battle, and if you were playing on console, especially, actually trying to use the sprint bu button would always cause the game to stutter because uh, suddenly you were moving way faster than it expected you to. Um, but now you can just run wherever you want, and it speeds things up so much in the, in the Citadel, I'll, I'll say that. Also, the elevators don't take forever, and there's a skip button, so when the game has properly loaded whatever's after the elevator, you can skip over the dialogue scene and just be where you want to be if you want. It's useful. Now I just imagine more of a turbo elevator that says, oh, right, you can go there now. Zoom! <laughs> Everyone just kind of lurches about trying to keep their balance on the super fast elevator. Mm. You want It'd be me funny. To you? I want you to try. Also, hi Rex. Yep, Rex is here. I'm 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 comparing this in my mind to the Go same on. scene in yeah. uh, the comparison video I, I watched from GameSpot right before we started doing this video, and. Yeah, the lighting is substantially different. The scene was actually quite a bit more shadowy in the original version. But unlike a lot of remasters where it just We're seems like they forgot the effect their lighting engine had on the not scene, I'm not really sure you lose anything if the lighting engine is slightly different in Mass Effect 1. Also, Garrus is... Garrus, what, I was say, Garrus, what's right with your face? <laughs> Garrus's face in the original PC version would never load past its low-res texture. I think the best you could possibly do is twiddle with some things in the config files and get him to load to his medium texture. But, um, like, now his face works. What a novel concept. <laughs> uh, if you're playing the, the, the console version, that was one of the few things that was like always, you, you always had the better end of the deal on was Garrus's face. 
Also, yeah, the level up system is still intact. Thank God. I guess they didn't make many major overhauls there. I guess like if if people were ever nervous about Mass Effect One being changed to bring it into step with the sequels, they would have been worried that it would impact the gameplay in a substantial way. But to be honest, even with the imp even with the overhauls made to the UI or the way weapon aiming works, it's still Mass Effect One warts and all some of the warts have just been you know uh, they've had some ointments applied to them <laughs> um so it's just generally more fun to play one of the things that's definitely more fun are the grenades which for whatever <laughs> you do right i care for some reason <laughs> <laughs> for whatever fucking reason in the original game um the grenade button was the back button or in playstation parlance the select button Oof. I'm not really sure why, but it was pretty much impossible to to use the grenades while moving because you'd have to take your thumb off the movement stick in order to do it. Now, it's still not perfect because it's on the square slash X button now, and that's that's a face button, so you can't really aim with the right stick while, fu while throwing grenades, but it's still a lot more manageable. And honestly, because the grenades are kind of like these delayed straight line sticky bomb things, there's not, a, like, it, it, you don't lose a whole lot by not being able to fire grenades while aiming. You're probably going to have an easy, oh, God damn it, it's stuck to the chair. You're probably gonna have um, an easier time actually using the grenades if you're playing keyboard and mouse, but, I, I still find myself actually using the grenades in gamepad mode, and that's a lot more than I could say for the grenades in the console version of the original release. Also, like, enhanced squad control. You can command your squad mates to go where you want them to and do what you, what you want them to do like you could in 2 and 3, and that's... That's an improvement over the console version. I'm pretty sure you had that capability in the PC version of the original, but um, I haven't played the PC version extensively, so I couldn't tell you. Also, um, I don't usually tell my squad mates where to go, so I didn't use that feature even in the sequels, to be honest. Like, I don't care where my squad mates are most of the time. I just tell them to use their powers, and that's all I ever did. Time to find somewhere else to work. Yep. Yeah, yeah. I never liked Just Fist go. anyway. Yeah, I never liked Fist anyway. Hmm. So, like... Would have been quicker to just kill them. <sighs> people isn't always the I just... Words cannot express how happy this remaster in particular makes me. It even brings in the uh, minigame from the PC version instead of that lame-ass quick-time event that um, the console version used, where you just had the four face buttons flashing Simon at you. Um, <laughs> one thing that I will say about combat, though, is that it seems like the AI has been not necessarily fixed, but made a little less rock stupid. Um, the enemies don't seem to... Um, Walk right in the way of your bullets. <laughs> yeah, they don't seem to run around the battlefield like complete headless chickens anymore. I've also noticed a distinct lack of NPCs yelling, enemies everywhere, or I will destroy you. Although it's possible I just haven't reached the side quests where that happens yet. Um, so I guess we'll see. I hope they keep the I will destroy you line in the game somewhere though, because Bioware being Bioware, Mass Effect 3 dunks on it at some point. And that joke will just be lost if it's eliminated Wait, from the game completely. So, like, for context, I skipped over this in the Brain Scratch playthrough because I skipped over most of the side quests. But in the original game, there were a lot of prefab buildings that um, that contained a lot of mooks. And whenever you, like, went into one of these, you'd be hearing the same NPC line, like, twice a picosecond. They would be yelling at you. They would be yelling at you, like, the same two or three lines. Enemies everywhere! Enemies everywhere! Uh, it was always in the same Narmi voice, too, so, like, 
Kind of just reminds me of the Prozidi video where he goes on the JRPG victory quotes. I think he's got the point. <laughs> 12 hours later, I think he's got the point. <laughs> Shut up. <laughs> really feeling it. <laughs> uh, but yeah. Um... <laughs> Fist still does the thing where he where he looks like you're, you're splashing water on his face when, when, when Rex draws a shotgun on him. Let's move. We have to save that quarian. So okay, like it's it it's it it's Mass Effect One, and it's been like like really seriously overhauled. But it's still Mass Effect One, and like if if you didn't like the combat before, y you might get more enjoyment out of it now. But it's probably not going to change your mind super much. Well, that's usually the case with a lot of remasters compared to full remakes. Yeah. You can fix you can fix as much as you want, but if it's still fundamentally the same game as you played all those years ago, it's whether you liked it or not, that's probably not going to change it. Yeah, but like if you saw some merit in it and just had some trouble getting into it, I think Mass Effect Legendary Edition is the is the way to go. It's you'll have a you'll have a an easy enough time getting through it because of the quality of life changes. The inventory, which I'm not actually showing on screen in this video, um, there's, there was a lot of footage to sift through, I kind of forgot. But um, like the inventory system is just a lot more manageable now. All of your stuff is categorized into different, into different lists. You can mark any item you want to mark as junk. And then with a single button press, you can sell all your junk or uh, process it into Omnigel for use repairing your Mako or or skipping lock picking mini games that kind of thing it's um it's like the the days of slowly slowly scrolling through one long list of items they're gone thank you saving time is always appreciated but like if go in guns and blazing nope cutscene but like if you were annoyed by like the all the big empty planets with the prefab buildings and recycled no mook battles the uh, like those are still here they're just more fun because the systems they're built around are smoothed out compared to the original also i'm surprised by how well mass effect 1's cutscenes hold up um like this was early xbox 360 oh <laughs> This guy's pathfinding just sort of really got stuck there, didn't it? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I said the the AI seems to have been smoothed out, but honestly, <laughs> the combat systems are still like really chaotic, and uh, sometimes it shows. One thing I will I will compliment though is that. Um, it doesn't take forever in a decade for your first aid cooldown to go through. So, like, you still wind up having to bunker down and wait if you're seriously injured and need your shields to recharge. But you're not as likely to... You're not as likely to just wind up sitting there for five minutes, unable to unable to get back into the action because it takes forever for first aid to um, cool down the way you 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 frequently would have to just get out of battle entirely in the original game because it takes a while for metagel to recharge once you've used it and you could end up being hurt again really goddamn fast in the original game especially early on when you didn't have as much health but like, oh boy, is it time for the moon buggy? Oh yes, it's time for the moon buggy. Yay! I picked this side quest planet in particular because while it's not the most visually striking in the game, it does have a Thresher Maw on it. And that's one of the things that I definitely wanted to show off because the Thresher Maw enemy has been seriously altered in the remaster for the better. Because, okay, in the original it was this giant worm monster that you would always encounter on flat planes on a planet. And um, it was designed to be fought in the vehicle, obviously, because it's a giant worm monster. You're going to want to go at it with a fucking tank. But, like, it would duck under the ground, and then it would pop out of the ground, and there would be no indication as to where it was going. So um, 
A not uncommon occurrence in the original game was that it would just pop up directly under your tank and instantly kill you. Yeah, it was it was aggravating. Well, they've changed the Mako. They've changed the the way the Mako repairs itself when it's damaged. They've changed uh, the the way the battle with the Thresher Ma itself plays out. It's just all a lot more manageable oh, now. The sink. <laughs> there is an option in the options menu to determine how the Mako steers itself. Basically, you can steer it relative to where its hull is pointing, or you can steer it relative to the camera. But you're still going to be controlling the Mako primarily with the left stick, just like in the original game. So it doesn't change the gameplay all that much. I would just stick with relative to the camera, but that's what I'm used to. The thing that's really changed about the Mako is that its weight has been tweaked substantially. It still bounces around, as you can see, but it doesn't bounce around quite so violently anymore. So six wheel drive. it feels like it's doing what it originally meant to do, just doing it without hampering your, your control quite so much. You can still go up walls. I guess to compensate for the fact that the Mako feels weightier than it used to, they installed these uh, jet boosters on the back that, that will rocket you forward, which helps you climb all the walls that you used to be able to climb normally and also just generally makes travel across the wasteland a bit faster. It also helps quite a lot that um, the graphics are better, mostly, <laughs> except for that weird animation just there. Um, the game still doesn't quite know what to do when Shepard is trying to go through uh, particularly steep terrain on foot, but like, there isn't quite so much stuttering involved on the big planets as there was on the Xbox 360 and because the textures for everything are a lot nicer that sort of picturesque planetary landscape atmosphere that the original game had comes through a lot more clearly here like it always had a nice feeling when you were cruising around a planet on the moon buggy this open vast frontier looking for minerals and stuff and while the gameplay is on, the, on these planets is still just as simplistic as it used to be the feeling of traveling across these planets is a lot better when you're not wrestling with the goddamn moon buggies bullshit controls all the time um it's it's not as it's not as refined a vehicle as the one in mass effect andromeda where they got the Need for Speed team in and got them to make a vehicle that actually controls like a vehicle, but it's definitely a, a huge upgrade over the original game, which just sort of brought down the experience every time you had to control this goddamn thing. But by far, the best thing about the Mako now is the way the repair function works. When the Mako is damaged, you have to... Hit a button to, to use some of your stocked up Omni Gel to repair the vehicle. But whenever you did this in the original game, you would be stuck in place just waiting for the repair cycle to go through. So it wasn't feasible to do it in battle. If you wanted to do it in battle, you'd have to get your vehicle to a safe place first, like behind um, a, a steep rock wall where the enemies couldn't shoot you or just generally away from the battle entirely if you were trying to do it during a Thresher Maw encounter. Basically what happens now is that um, when you need to re repair your vehicle, you can still move the vehicle around, but you can't use the thrusters and you can't use the guns. So you can evade attacks, but you can't evade them quite as effectively as you normally would. Um, and you can't fight back until the repair cycle finishes. So, essentially, you can repair yourself in combat now without leaving the battlefield or going into hiding. Oh, good. You don't have to hide yourself in order to repair yourself. Yeah, you don't have to hide yourself, and you don't have to consign yourself to 20 seconds of just not playing the game every time you do. Mm. So, it's, it's, it, the whole thing just feels a lot more dynamic now, and that's good. Anyway, there's our old friend, the Thresher Maw. It's still annoying. It still spews acid at you that just bypasses your kinetic barriers entirely. But it, it actually shows you where the goddamn thing is going now. 
it's so much more fun to fight these things when they're not made of pure condensed bullshit. <laughs> um, so, like... Oh, God. The Thresher Maws only ever, like, appeared in this game, in this form. There was a boss fight against a Thresher Maw in Mass Effect 2 in, like, Grunt's loyalty mission. But um, it was a one-time thing, and it was, like, it was like it was it was really like confined and and restricted. It's cool to be able to fight these things on your own terms for once, and not have it suck. They're still really hard to dodge. The acid splashes are. Oh, this is a new thing. I, I forgot about this. Okay, so in Mass Effect Two, when you fought the Thresher Mall, you saw these tentacle things all around the battlefield. Well, now they're here. In Mass Effect One, they appear part way through the battle when the Thresher Maw is seriously injured and it decides to hide underground a bit more. So you have to shoot these sensory tensile tentacles to draw it back out so you can finish it off. It's not a particularly big change to the fight, but it is something new that wasn't in the original game. It really feels like they kind of went out of their way to make sure you had something to do in the actual Mako instead of bounce about. <laughs> Well, the Thresher Maw fights were always here. They just kind of weren't fun. Well, he's almost dead. Yep. Um, also, the cooldown on the repair function is a lot shorter than it used to be, too. So that's a thing. Hey. Man, it's such... It, it's so novel to get out of the vehicle and not have to watch, like, the textures on the ground load in every single time. Because that was a thing that happened in the original game. You'd get out of the Mako, and the texture on the ground would be low res, and then it would pop to medium res, and then it would pop to large to, to high res. Just like, like all the textures in the game, except because you were getting in and out of the vehicle, it would happen every time. <laughs> right. And I, I never wanted to get out of the vehicle, because... Um, that would happen and it would cause the game to stutter and it wasn't very fun. But another thing that they changed about the Mako is that in the original game there was an experience penalty for actually killing things in the tank. So what a lot of players would end up doing was get out of the tank to kill everything to get the maximum experience out of every encounter. I mean, makes sense. So. They would even do it with a Thresher Maul though. Um, oh, you mean get it to like within one pixel of it, tell jump out, and then to try to kill it that way? Yeah. <laughs> um, so, like, you don't have to do that anymore. Don't bother, seriously. The experience penalty isn't there. Also, now we're in Mass Effect 2, which looks just as nice as it always did, but, you know, lots of crates. Lots and lots of crates everywhere. I can't Everyone's wait. Sort of shipping companies between 1 and 2. I can't wait to play Overlord and Lair of the Shadow Broker, where the, the environments are more um, intricate, but here it's it's just kind of like a, every level is a is a mess of crates um with a new set dressing <laughs> that was essentially how mass effect 2 worked i love mass effect 2 they did a wonderful job at turning their their deadline and their budget into um a magnificent game but um compared to one and three it does kind of feel the blandest in terms of level design And um, I couldn't really spot any major differences in the way the game looked, apart from just having nicer textures everywhere and maybe a smoother lighting engine. I don't know. But I mean, some, sometimes that's enough. Yeah. But they did change some substantial things that um, I wouldn't be able to show off in video form even if I tried. For example, um, I've heard that they've overhauled the way that the Paragon and Renegade system works in Mass Effect 2, which is good. Because in the original game, the costs for everything would be determined by how many towns you had visited at the point you reached a choice. Which meant you could bone yourself completely by visiting all four towns as soon as they became available. I'm not really sure how they fixed this, I just know that they mentioned fixing it in an interview. So. I'm looking forward to seeing how they tweaked that particular element. Maybe you'll even be able to play a Paragate in this game and not be completely screwed. So um, that'll be interesting. The other thing 
that they fixed, though, is that the oodles and oodles of DLC weapons and armor that would just get dumped on you at the start of the game the moment you gained access to the ship have been integrated into the game so that you have to acquire them naturally now. So, um, well, like in side quests or just buy them from a shop or something? Buy them from a shop, research them at the, at, at the lab, that kind of thing. I haven't um, gotten far enough into the game to see how well they've implemented this, but just not having 600 weapons at the beginning of the game that immediately make your starter gear obsolete is already a massive improvement. They do, let, they do let you start the game with the recon hood armor item and the arc projector heavy weapon, but those aren't quite so... Um, drastic. Also, they added the dress and the hoodie from Mass Effect 3 into Mass Effect 2, so that's nice. You can walk around that's the nice ship in something, in something that looks um, kind of okay. But uh, Because I, I never really liked the casual wear in Mass Effect 2, so I'm glad they added that. Um, maybe they even went as far, hopefully, to fix that animation in the cutscene with Garrus where the game doesn't care what gender you picked and just has... Shepherd manspreading in a dress. That was um, that was always awkward. Is the joke still around where Shepherd can't dance? Yes. <laughs> that goes back to, to um, the first game where you could go into a nightclub and there was a spot you could select on the dance floor where Shepherd would dance, but Shepherd's dancing animation was, uh, putting it bluntly, kind of pitiful. <laughs> so he or she would just stand there bopping her head and it looked less like they were dancing at a club and more like they were, you know, just casually listening to music in their own home and had stopped to, you know, just take it in. But <laughs> um, that was one of the many, many things that the Citadel DLC in Mass Effect 3 dunked on before um, saying goodbye to the crew. We tried to keep you as intact as possible. Uh, it, it's good to see that they got the lighting right in the elusive man scenes, though. This is was always one of the most visually striking things in Mass Effect 2, the elusive man cutscenes, where you would have a video call with the elusive man, but the camera would cut to his end so that you could see the 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 burning multicolor sun that he had decided to make the view for his headquarters, the mysterious dimness of his office, which I can only assume he chose because it makes him look intimidating over the vidcom <laughs> you could have trained an entire army for what you spent to bring it is all about how you present yourself on that note i didn't i didn't mention that each game uses their original graphics engine fundamentally tweaks yes but a lot of quirks that existed in the original games are still there and in mass effect one unfortunately that means we're still seeing the original mass effect one hologram calls everywhere which um came with the disturbing side effect of being able to see different parts of the 3D model through other parts of the 3D model. So uh, you can see everyone's eyeballs through their eyelids and stuff still in Mass Effect 1. That hasn't been fixed. It has been, like, it was improved on in the PC version, but it still looks kind of weird. And it's still here in the remaster, so... Yeah, it, 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 the, the games still have their quirks. There's not as much weirdness going on in, with Mass Effect 1's eyelids, but there is still some. That kind of thing. Fair enough. And Mass Effect 3 is once again the game that has aged the best, graphically. Because, uh, holy hell, this game still looks nice. The game still has typical Bioware animation and clipping problems, but, like, the models are very smooth. And with some slightly smoothed out textures, I think the game almost looks on par with PlayStation 4 stuff a lot of the time. Especially the armor. And that's very nice, at least. I can tell the lighting's been improved that much, it's obvious. Mass Effect 3 always looked pretty nice. It always had some good lighting. Some good reflective surfaces on the armor if you chose to set your armor to that particular pattern. But even on, like, PC... Sometimes the textures on specific objects weren't up to snuff, and it looks like Mass Effects 2 and 3, even if they haven't been upgraded as much as Mass Effect 1 have, they've, um, they've smoothed out a lot of the less important textures, so the game looks more uniformly well, um, uh, well put together. Please trust me. Which is good in Mass Effect 3's case, because Mass Effect 3 
had a had a lot more visually striking environments and a lot more well put together character models and a lot more cinematic direction in the cutscenes than the previous two games. Like Mass Effect 1 had its cinematic cutscenes here and there and it had its conversation scenes which were always full of stock animations. Mass Effect 3 um it had a lot it had a lot less um, dialogue choice and its conversation scenes, but to trade off for that, they had a lot more like dynamic character motion and considered ca uh, camera animations in the dialogue scenes. So, yeah. On the subject of cutscenes, I might as well address this now. One of the things that happened during like pre release interviews and stuff was that. BioWare's uh, developer guy very foolishly um, decided to bring up some examples of things that he had tweaked, things that the team had tweaked about, like, the presentation of Mass Effect 2. And one of the things they brought up, which they shouldn't have brought up considering how people knee-jerk at this kind of thing in 2021, was, like, the weird, awkward camera angles in Mass Effect 2 that would occasionally pop up. And the example he used for this was that, like, some like once or twice in Mass Effect 2, for no particular reason, during a, uh, a dialogue sequence, the camera would focus in on an angle that showed Miranda's butt as the most prominent thing in view. Wait, wasn't that wasn't that a meme for a while? Yeah, kind of. And I guess some people took this to mean that Miranda was being censored. No, I can I can tell you like right away. Within, like, 20 minutes of starting Mass Effect 2, you'll get your fill of Miranda's butt. It's just not in specific awkward cutscenes anymore. Because, like, there were scenes where it was there for no reason. Like, it didn't... It Like, there was nothing in the conversation itself that, that suggested it should be there. <laughs> but it was. And they, they tweaked some camera angles in conversations so that that wouldn't happen anymore, apparently. But... Like, it's still there. You're still going to see it, perverts. But, like, they just smoothed out some of the the camera angles. And that's, like, that's, that's an understandable change to want to make because, like, the camera angles in Mass Effect 1 and 2, like, they've show, they show their age a lot of the time. They're just, like, the camera jumping back and forth between characters at predetermined angles. Sometimes you see the same angle twice, twice in one conversation of, of Captain Anderson pacing back and forth as he explains something. Why? And it's like over, over, the, over the course of the game, you stop thinking about it quite so much, but occasionally it does just look stilted. And I, I'm glad they at least made some efforts to smooth that out in the previous two games, but it's a lot more dynamic in Mass Effect 3 where... In the middle of conversations, characters are actively doing things. Although, um, uh, uh, Vega's assault rifle clipping through his armor there, that's that's something I would have liked to see upgraded, I'm going to say. <laughs> oh, man. To the door he goes. At least it's not Dragon Age Origins, where everyone's shoulder armor was constantly clipping through their own chest plates. Because, um... That was a thing that happened in Origins a lot. And of course, Mass Effect 3 is still the best one in the series to play, even if the story has some disappointing elements and I don't like the opening sequence all that much. I decided to show the Mars mission because it is, it is quite nice looking, and also it has like the first, the first like really interesting combat sequences in the game. It's a good place to show off how badass the Vanguard is. I didn't read that, James. Repeat. But like... Ah. Uh, that's another reason that I wanted to show off the Mars sequence is that like... The, the sandstorm in the background, I think, is a good place to show off how the textures have been up in the remaster. I love the, the atmosphere in the Mars sequence in Mass Effect 3. Like, you know how I said Mass Effect 2 was a bit bland, recycled crates everywhere? Mass Effect 3 does not have that problem. All of the environments are pretty unique. 
There's a lot of indoor sequences, but they actually managed to make the indoor sequences look and feel different from other indoor sequences, which was not something Mass Effect 2 did. Uh, Shoot the core. I like how, <laughs> because of the way squad powers work, whenever a, whenever a squad mate has a grenade power in Mass Effect 3, you can just use the power on an enemy and it will instantly explode without being thrown. <laughs> it's always been a weird quirk of the of the Mass Effect 3 combat system. But, you know, Mass Effect... Who cares? Throw that grenade through the wall at our enemies. What? You can do it. I swear. <laughs> <laughs> Teleportation, yeah. Uh, the biotic charge is my favorite power in all of Mass Effect. It's not teleportation. What it does is it basically just... Okay, you know how the mass relays uh, basically slingshot a spaceship across the galaxy at ultra ludicrous speed so that you can get from one yes. place to another instantly? It's basically the same principle. You slingshot yourself directly at the enemy's face and ram into them like a battering ram. It's a really So you became the flash basically. Yeah. It's a really it's a really useful ability because not only does it damage the enemy and stagger them, it also um it, it also regenerates some of your barriers. You see you see that purple bar down there? That's your shields or your barriers depending on what character class you're playing. And the moment you ram into someone with the with, with the um charge ability, you regenerate like half of that. If you're Especially in Mass Effect 3, where you have influence over your power cooldowns because the weapon weight system plays into that. In Mass Effect 3, if, you, if you're if you just using, like, your shotgun and your submachine gun, and you've got, like, lightweight materials um, lowering their weight and everything, you can use the charge ability, like, so frequently. And it's possible to just ram into the enemy's face repeatedly at point-blank range, even. And regenerate your shields every time. So if you play your cards right, you can go an absurd amount of time without actually taking any real damage. One of my favorite tactics in Mass Effect 2 is that when you have to fight, like, the Geth Colossus mini-boss. It's this giant Geth spider robot. Um, that's, like, twice your size. Just circle around it in point-blank range and use the biotic charge whenever it cools down to recharge your your barriers. And in normal mode, you can easily take it down without doing any of the fancy cover-based tactics that people tell you you should be doing against it. <laughs> Just obliterate it, and it's gone. So... Just shoot it, Fox. They're all over there. Ah, uh, yes. And then, uh, then, of course, Mass Effect 3 introduced power combinations. Whenever you... Like, certain powers are primers, and other powers are detonators. And, like, depending on what kind of explosion you're trying to detonate, um, different combinations of powers could be used to deal extreme punishment to the enemy. What I'm using in this particular section is that... is Liara's, um... Liara's singularity, which creates like a miniature sort of black hole-ish kind of thing that um, that causes enemies to float up in orbit around it. If you use your biotic charge to just ram into the enemies whenever they're floating, it causes this massive explosion that deals, that deals splash damage to all the nearby enemies. It can be really, really, really effective. And it's just another reason that I love the Vanguard so goddamn much. But yeah, Anderson. I figured it would be awkward to end the video on just a battle sequence fading out. So I flashed backward in time a little bit to show a little bit more of the opening of Mass Effect 3. Thanks. It's good I did because this will give you a visual comparison of what Anderson looked like in Mass Effect 3. Uh, honestly, like oddly, because of the way his face animates in Mass Effect 1, I kind of feel like... Mass Effect 1's Anderson looks better than Mass Effect 3's Anderson now. Because, like, Mass Effect 3 Anderson always had a bit of a Muppet mouth at times. Like, his face wouldn't emote quite as much as it did in Mass Effect 1. It was weird. So now Mass Effect 1 Anderson has all of the animation that Mass Effect 1 Anderson did, but it's got Mass Effect 3 Anderson's face. So... It just winds up looking like a downgrade once you go from Mass Effect 1 to Mass Effect 3. 
it's just weird, man. I don't get it. I'll be back for you, and I'll bring everything I can. Good luck. You too, Jeff. The galaxy's fate depends on this weird emo goth girl, and nobody knows what to make of it. That's my headcanon now, and um, <laughs> I'm sticking to it. I will say that the stuff that's actually FMVs, like I think this scene is mostly FMV. It does look pretty good. It does like you can you can see pretty clearly when it's happening because it's not like as smooth looking as the in-engine stuff, but. Uh, they did at least make sure that it looks good on a 1080p screen, which I suppose wasn't hard because the game was designed for 1080p computers. But um, I just figured it was worth noting that the FMVs in this remaster are not going to be a complete train wreck like they sometimes are in the in, in these kind of in these kind of re-releases. Yeah, you don't want to have them be all stuttery and stuff. Oh no. <laughs> stuttery or just blurry sometimes yeah i feel like we're at a point where we don't need to worry about that too much because like we have ai up now and that usually does produce some pretty good results but yeah the the game as a whole looks quite nice you'd be surprised what stuff in mass effect one actually wasn't an fmv though <laughs> um I guess this remaster well, you can, is. You, a, can play, you can play spot the difference in that in the remaster now. Yeah, but like um, in Mass Effect One, you'd expect a lot of the scenes where the ship was flying around to be FMVs, but they have a tendency to be real time more often than you expect. Huh. Which is good because it meant it means that in in a lot of those scenes they upres the star textures and the planet textures and the ship textures and even those look better now. That's certainly good. But. Yeah, that's the Mass Effect Legendary Edition. It's a remaster for the most part. Some under-the-hood tweaks in the second two games, but I'm really looking forward to, to finding the time to dive into Mass Effect 1 and play it through properly. Like, that's that's been the most torturous element of doing this impressions video, is that I had to rush through, like, nine parts worth of the original game to get to the point where the Mako was so that I could record Mako footage just to have Mako footage in this video. And I had to skip all the side quests. Well, now you can go back and do that. <laughs> now I can You're not go quite back free yet. You still got to edit it, so. <laughs> yeah. Uh, my job isn't quite done yet. But uh, I, I do recommend this remaster to anyone who's interested in getting into the series because... Even if you're playing on PC, like I was for this video, the compatibility issues that the original games had are obviously ironed out. Um, in Mass Effect 1's case, if, you're, if your computer had an AMD processor that was more recent than, say, 2010, you would have some serious lighting issues on certain planets. And because of, of some legacy 3D lighting thing that existed in the old CPU that doesn't now... And it was just, uh, I wasn't able to play Mass Effect 1 on PC until I got this remaster, or at least until, well, actually, now that I think about it, um, on this newer PC that I have, I probably could have done, because this one has an Intel processor. It would have worked fine, but it's good to have a version of Mass Effect 1 that doesn't have those weird quirks. Garrus' face works. The You don't have to mod in good textures to see everything in a not blurry fashion uh i'm explaining this poorly basically mass effect one is way better to play now and you don't need to mod the gamepad support in if you want gamepad support and i'm looking forward to playing this on ps4 when my ps4 copy unlocks tomorrow so uh, yeah oh well, regardless we appreciate the uh, early look at a uh, copy and uh lewis was super giddy about that so uh yeah, thanks, thank, thanks for watching, everyone, and we'll see you in our next uh, preview whenever that may be. <laughs>